Hi there and welcome. Jonathan here. These talks are offered freely so that no one is ever denied access to these practices. Your support makes a big difference. If you feel inspired to make a donation, please go to jonathanfaust.com. Thank you. teachers for many years would kind of tell this story of how, you know, he counseled people over many, many years, so lots of long-term relationships with students. So he told this story of this, you know, young woman in the ashram who would come to him and say, you know, I, I really want to be in a relationship. You know, I, I've done the monk thing. This is what I know I really, really want. And so after challenging her a little bit, you know, he kind of gave her approval, and she explored being in a relationship. And, and after a while, she met with him again and said, you know, what I really, really want is marriage. I, I really want the commitment. I think I'll feel, you know, I'll just feel safer. I'll feel more alive. And so he kind of approved that. After some time, you know, she said, well, we're, we're struggling a little bit, but, you know, I think what I really want is kids. I think the kids will really support us in our relationship and give us a real place of focus and listen, kind of approve that. Many years later, she said, you know, I think if we could just get the kids out of the house, I think then we'll be really, really happy, you know. Then many, many years later, she was, you know, if I could just get rid of my husband, I think I'd be really, really happy. <laughs> Of course, that's what drives our lives. You know, there's something that's going to make you happy. And we tend to feel it's external. And sometimes it is external, and sometimes we can actually do a lot internally as well. The paradox, and you know, spiritual practice is always about a paradox. And it's really finding the balance between making your life happen through intention, through wise intention or aspiration, having the sense of willpower and focus, but also is about letting your life happen, about cultivating a kind of a receptive, non-judging quality of mind as well. So I'd like to talk tonight a little bit about that balance. I'd like to talk about how, first, how your intention works better when it's aligned with reality how intention really sets your path and dramatically can affect your life experience. How your intention can be supported by taking the rocking chair test, which I know we've done before, but you can't do it too much. And how having a clear intention requires that you monitor yourself, that you monitor your integrity. But intention is also about choosing the kind of pain you want because life is not without pain and suffering, but there's a conscious choice of pain. There was a, a spiritual teacher who told this story that I found quite, I was fascinated by this story, that at some point in his life he realized that, that he was being too internal, like too, too focused inward, and that he wasn't really being very, uh, relational, and there was a lot to learn about relationships. And he decided that he wanted to explore how he could be more, more intimate and alive in his relationships. And so he had a question for himself, an inquiry that he would always ask himself, how am I avoiding intimacy right now? And that was his intentional practice. And he, he described what a powerful mirror it was because he became more aware of when he was self-protective or when he was trying to dominate or when he was judging another person. And he said it was very, very challenging because it forced him to really open his heart to what it meant to be intimate with others. 
but also to notice every time he would sort of close off. And he described how that practice was a very, very helpful way of sort of waking up. And it's helpful to, to pause around your life and to ask yourself, how am I doing? Is what I'm doing now truly aligned with what I want out of this life? And so it's an interesting question of how would you rate yourself with your life living in intention? So I, I started this process uh, a couple of years back of doing an annual review um, inspired by a guy named James Clear who uh, suggested this. And, and, and he published his as a way of being really transparent. So I did the same thing. So if you want to, if you want to read it, it's actually on my uh, site. But you ask yourself what went well, what didn't go so well, and what am I working on? So in brief, as I did my reflection, my, my home life is really harmonious. My health is great. Uh, hopefully I'm getting better at teaching and speaking. Um, I've developed more skills in photography and video and creative stuff, which is a passion of mine. I've had some success in simplifying, which was a very important intention last year. And I did a fair bit of uh, adventures and savoring, which is another high value for me. And also my intention to be of service was important. And things have gone pretty well in terms of teaching and supporting organizations and so forth. So that felt good. And then to look at what didn't go well. Um, you may recall I was, had this late night spiritual talk show that we were about to host. We had a big, uh, someone really getting behind it. And at the last minute they pulled the funding. That was a bummer. Maybe, maybe not. Good news, bad news, who knows? could be the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, I'm still not very organized financially. Um, I still haven't figured out my migraines. I'm still terrible at marketing and self-promotion. And I'm not sure what the next really big focus is with, with that talk show being taken away. And so that helped me to clarify what I what am I working on? What do I want? And most important for me is I want to cultivate more presence and more compassion in my life. I want to continue to improve my skills as a teacher and communicator. I want to cultivate more wholesome habits. And I want to continue to dedicate more time to creative pursuits, of photography and video and writing. And not least, I want to have fun, which in my mind is a very, very high spiritual practice, having fun. So there's something about the transparency and sharing all that I just find helpful because it makes me more accountable to myself. And in many ways, that's what we all need on some level, is to know what we want and then have a way to hold yourself accountable. And there can be tremendous satisfaction when you feel like you, your actions are in line with where you want to go. The, the phone ringing just reminded me, if, if you know Sokni Rinpoche, he's a great, he's a really wonderful Tibetan teacher. Whenever, the, whenever a phone rings, he always says, I hope it's good news. <laughs> <laughs> so forming an intention is a real art. Like knowing what you want is a real art. It's as if you go into a restaurant and you say to the waitress, I'll have what you think would be good for me. And that's what you get. 
And when you don't have a clear intention, that's kind of how it's served up. When you can really get specific and real about what you want, then you can actually order off the menu. I had, I had shared this little model with you before, but I always come back to it. It's so helpful. Uh, my friend Michael, who was here in class a while back, talked about how, how your, your time and your awareness go into four different quadrants. One quadrant of your life is all about reactivity. It's the phone call that has to be answered, the email you weren't expecting, just dealing with the stuff that happens in life. The next quadrant is all the stuff you said you were going to do. So that's the projects you're working on, the commitments, the contracts that you have. The third quadrant is being intentional around planning, your future planning. So that's really asking yourself, what do I really, really want? And the fourth quadrant is about presence in the moment. And that's not just meditation and yoga. It's, it's art, it's poetry, it's nature. It's all the stuff that brings you into, into the magic present moment. And if you're not really, really intentional, all of your attention is going to slide into that first quadrant where all you're doing is reacting and putting out fires. And what I found to be very, very helpful in my life is the more time I spend in the fourth quadrant, the more it affects the quality of my life. And you may know when you have a meditation practice where you just sit every day, something gets a little bit clearer. You know, you're a little bit less reactive. So determining what you can commit to that goes into the fourth quadrant of presence is very, very helpful. And that third quadrant of what do I really, really want can be enormously helpful. So a short little reflection, if you like, you can close your eyes. We'll do a little two-minute Zen pop quiz. When you think about the fourth quadrant in your life, that is to say, everything that you do that brings you into the moment and fills you with a sense of aliveness and wonder, that might be sitting in meditation, it might be yoga, it might be exercise, it might be time in nature, it might be intimate time with another person, it might be art or reading or poetry. What are those qualities in your life? When you think about them, when you imagine doing them now, what does that feel like on the inside? In exploring this inquiry, if you were to do more of what fills you with a sense of presence and wonder in your life, not perfectly, not all the time, but if you were to do it more, how do you imagine that would feel? How do you imagine that would affect the, the quality of your life? And just saying hello to that, letting that know you see it. And then if you like, you can let your eyes open or feel free to remain with them closed if you prefer. And so much about finding balance finding what, what feeds you on a very, very deep level so you're more available to your life. And finding that balance, and again, the paradox of both doing and being, uh, the practices that are about skillful action, and the practices that are all about pausing and renewing and, and filling your cup. And so much of our struggle in life is f sort of finding that the work-life balance. 
you know, finding that balance. But when we can find it, it is really kind of a sweet spot where instead of feeling obligated or worn down or overwhelmed, there can be the possibility of, of, of creative, joyful expression. But we're always looking, and it's important to acknowledge that, that this searching we have in life is an important part of our journey to find what really, really makes you happy. I remember really well a conversation I had in a bar in West Africa with this older guy with wild hair who'd been all over the world, and we were talking about the path and so forth, and he said, he said, I've done everything, you know, and he said, and I can be off on some wild adventure, or I can be with some beautiful person, or I can be on some, you know, wild ecstatic high, and there's always something in the back of my mind saying, this isn't it. And I think that's an, such, a, such an important part of our life, is to find that which most enlivens us. When the Buddha had his awakening, supposedly, one of the first insights was where he said, everyone is looking for happiness in exactly the wrong way. They were looking for happiness through, through satisfaction of sense desire. And he went on in his practice and in his teachings to, to speak about the beauty of, of the senses, you know, the, the enjoyment of the senses, but, but not the attachment or the indulging in the senses. So again, finding balance is so important. So it's so much about making it happen and letting it happen. Having a clear intention is a way of declaring what's most important in your life and aligning your life so that you move in a certain direction. But there's also a quality of letting your life happen, of opening intuition and being in the flow of life at the same time. So it's never just one or the other. So a good friend of mine was a therapist, and she had a, a couple uh, things that she would do when she was really stuck, you know, working with a really stubborn client. And uh, in her house where I used to hang out with her, she would have her chair and then her client's chair. And then behind her on the wall, there was this huge poster of, of the earth from outer space. And so she would, from time to time, just ask her client, like, so when you look at that, look at that photo up there, how does, how does that alter your perception of your problem? And when we think about the vastness of things, or as the great poet once said, Sometimes it's important to take the 3,000-year view. It helps to open up the frame. But part of that, another way of opening up the frame, is something you very well may have done. I, I've led this short reflection before, but it's called the rocking chair test. And that is when you're 102, sitting on your rocker, looking back over your life, what will have been most important? So why don't we try that on? It'd be a helpful little reflection. So when you're ready, you can close your eyes and let your attention come into the breath and let this be just a few minutes of just free association. Again, in this context of practice, of recognizing that being in, being in human form is temporary. That you and everyone you know and everyone you love will at some point, with no certain schedule, will fall away. As you reflect and imagine yourself on your rocker at 102 years old, looking back over your life. 
What was most important to you? And exploring the following question. This 102-year-old version of yourself. What advice does he or she have for you for right now? What advice does this person have for you? And if you were to follow that advice, not perfectly, not all the time, but if you were to incline your mind toward that, what would that be like? What do you imagine that would feel like? You might now deepen your breath again and feel free to let your eyes open or stay with them closed. Carlos Castanado speaks beautifully of, of having death as your advisor. He was saying to keep death on your left shoulder. And that could be a very helpful and expedient way to to clarify and organize your, your sense of what's possible and what you want, what you desire out of this life. There's a, a beautiful reading on the regrets of the dying. It was written by someone who sat with people going through the death process for many, many years. And the number one regret of the dying is where the person would say, I was not true to myself. So to pause and truly ask yourself what's most important can be quite a powerful way of reorient reorienting your life. And in that pursuit to to explore, to find what most resonates for you. The Buddha said, your path is to find your path. Your dharma is to find your dharma. He said, to, to explore and experiment, to find what works for you, and when you do, give yourself to it fully. That was his advice. In the meantime, we get to see through honest reflection and self-evaluation, what's been helpful and what hasn't been helpful. I remember sitting with a, with a woman in a one-on-one -on -one investigation and she was complaining you know, about her family and not being there for her and so forth. And she said, you know, I've been trying to control everyone my whole life. And I said, so how's that strategy working out for you? And I think it's really helpful to reflect on, on your strategies. How's it working out for you? And to be honest about that. Now the interesting thing about having an intention, getting clear what you want, is that it's not necessarily easy. So we can, we can experience sort of the, the, the suffering that comes out of continuing dissatisfaction from life, of trying to like chase lights and rainbows, which was very much a part of my life for many years. But also to realize that when you, when you really go for what you want, there's a cost. 
So you're actually choosing the kind of pain you'd like to be in. So as I look back on my life, I can't quite believe that uh, for many years I had a poverty vow. Uh, living in an ashram, I, has, I was making $28 a month for maybe 10 years. And then we got a raise to $35 a month. That was very exciting. And during that time, I also had a celibacy vow, just as part of the, the discipline of that particular tradition. Practicing celibacy when you're in your 20s and 30s, it's a ride. So there was a lot, there was a lot of burning in that practice. But what I got out of that practice was extraordinary. I was 24, I think, when I moved into the ashram. And you had to be celibate for at least, I forget, it was like six years or something like that. And uh, I was so enamored with the community. It was like, yeah, I want to stay. I'll, um, I'll take this on. And so instantly I began to see all these patterns of how I was in relationship. Of, oh, if I say this and she says this, maybe it means this. Like all that was taken away. And I began to see that people who I would have pursued, but in no way had the emotional maturity to maintain a relationship, those people became good friends. And I absolutely would have screwed that up. And I began to see that in my practice, by going more in and up, I was having very, very deep practices. I was having more, more intimacy in my life than ever through, through developing that capacity for like having very strong boundaries but being very, very present with people in my life. The benefits were absolutely extraordinary. So there was a burn. There was definitely a, a burn and a challenge in that practice. But the benefits were so extraordinary. So when you ask yourself what you want, there'll probably be some form of a burn. There'll be some kind of a cost in that. If you want to lose weight and get in shape, are you willing to feel the resistance that comes with taking on a program like that? Are you willing to go through, through the slipping? Are you willing to go through the procrastination? Are you willing to start over and over again? Are you willing to ask for help to keep your inspiration going? And if you, if you can say yes to that, that's a very alive process. Are you wanting to, to do more writing? Well, if so, are you willing to write for months and months with your words being really empty and feeling like you have nothing to say? Are you wanting to find more like-minded people in your life? Well, are you willing to get out there and mix it up and discover people you don't want to be with to help you define who you do want to be with? <laughs> Are you want, do you want more intimacy in your life? Are you willing to build in the, the risk, uh, the fear of rejection, the vulnerability that comes with it? So part of having a clear intention is about knowing that there's a certain cost. We've talked before, but it's, I think it's also very helpful, and particularly with the beginning of a new year, to reflect on the observances and the restraints. That when you're clear what you really want, there will be certain practices, certain disciplines that will be very, very helpful for you. that will help to keep that alive. You know, so if you're wanting more non-judging awareness in your life, and let's say, Meditation is supportive to that. And so you decide, okay, I, this is what I want. Here are the practices I'm going to do. 
And then you make a commitment to that. That becomes your intention. Then you monitor how well you're doing in that. But equally, with having observances, it's also very helpful to be aware of restraints. What are the activities that take you away from mindfulness? And what if you actually didn't do those things? You know, what if you dropped out certain activities that you knew sort of distracted you or, or drained you or pulled your energy away, and you did that as a discipline? That is equally powerful. So the practice of observance and restraint, to ask yourself, what are the actions and activities that are going to take me where I want to go? And what am I not going to do that's going to also support me toward that end result? A very, really, really helpful reflection, I find. Because what we're doing is we're really taking on the discipline. We're taking on a, a practice that builds fire and resistance, and that becomes, that becomes part of it. So there have been some really interesting studies around intention. And they've found that for some people, declaring your intentions can be very, very helpful. And for others, not telling anyone can be really helpful. And so it's an interesting thing to monitor as well. Because sometimes, if you're, what, what they've found is if you're, if you're more of an extroverted person, and I've noticed this for myself, not that I'm an extrovert, but if there's something I want to do and I'm telling everyone about it, I get so much pleasure from talking about it that I don't really feel the need to do it anymore. <laughs> have, have you noticed this? It's a really interesting thing. It's the way the way the brain is wired. We're, we're wired for pleasure. So you can talk about your plans, and it's so satisfying. That's enough. <laughs> So part of it is to really look at what would most support you. If you have any, any intention around becoming more awake, cultivating less judgment in your life, it's very helpful to, to know that very, very few people can do it by themselves. And that's why there have been ashrams and spiritual communities and zendos and monasteries through, a millennia, through these millennia. Because when you have an intention to wake up, to be less mindful, as the Buddha said 2,500 years ago, he said you're swimming upstream. Not just against your own conditioning, which is to avoid pain and seek pleasure, but in particular, he said, the, the culture. Because the culture is not so much about slowing down, pausing, and waking up. You may have noticed. Our entire culture runs on desire. Buy these things, will make you happy. And if you're feeling anything resembling unpleasant, check out the drugs we have for you. Numb that pain. So there's an interesting analogy uh, I ran across a little while back that I find really helpful, and it's how a lobster grows. That when, when a lobster grows, its shell becomes too small. And so what it does is sort of crawls into a little crevice, and the, the shell molts, and the lobster is really vulnerable for a while, as you can imagine. And then a larger shell forms, and then it goes out into the world. And that's how we grow. We grow when we start feeling constrained. When we've, we're feeling more alive than what we've created for ourselves. When you realize that, you know, the friendships I have, I, I like, but they're a little constricting. Or this job, which I was so excited about, it's not very alive for me anymore. Really embracing the discomfort is integral to growth. So to turn your attention to 
to the discomfort, to the ouch, to the pain, to lean into it, to really sense what is this all about, is very challenging, particularly when we're in a culture that says, you're feeling discomfort? You're feeling some depression? Let's see how we can knock that out. And, you know, we're, we're surrounded with growth opportunities. And certainly there are times when having chemical aids are, is critical and highly important. But to really open your attention to how is my life not aligned with how I sense it can be? What that requires is slowing down, being really honest, but also being around others who can be in conversation around that. I've always made jokes about how, you know, when I lived in the ashram or, or here, when it was people are really dedicated to practice. And some can, someone can say, how are you doing? And you can say, you know, I'm just feeling, I'm just feeling really stuck and I've got this, just this resentment and just mild anxiety all the time. And the other person will say, wow, that's great. So, you know, it's like there's that recognition of like, ooh, there's something, there's something shifting here. So all great traditions that are designed around cultivating transformation, they all speak of three fundamental things. One being a daily practice, something that reminds you, helps you to slow down and pause. Dialing that in, very, very important. What are the practices that work for you? There are so many different techniques, and it's so important to find what are the what are the practices and disciplines that, that really work for you? And knowing those will change over time. The second element is time of intensive practice. Time where you can step away from your, your, your rhythms, your habits, your ruts, and go deep and inform yourself. So going off on retreat, and even, even just coming and stepping away for an evening can be so helpful. The third element is around sangha or community. To find others who want what you want. And that is truly of inestimable, inestimable value. And if you don't have that, I suggest that you go through that kind of uncomfortable process of, of finding those who really resonate with what you want. And, and that can be through certainly a class like this through uh, spiritual friends groups or the mentoring program, all kinds of stuff. But I was reminded how when I joined the Peace Corps and there were 75 of us in our training heading off to West Africa, I was really on fire with my practice at that time. And I thought, well, wow, I'm surrounded by all these, all these cool people. So I, the first meeting we had, I stood up and I said, I meditate twice a day and everyone who's interested in meditation, let's all meet over in that corner. <laughs> One guy. <laughs> That's all I needed. Every time, and he lived on the other side of the country, but whenever we'd come into town, we would sit, we'd talk about our practice, and talk about what we were reading, and that, that's invaluable. So I wish you well in finding that, finding that sense of support that will be aligned with what you most want in your life. Why don't we um, have just a few minutes of silence and we'll have a few announcements. So you might again guide your intention back to your breath. recalling these two fundamental questions of mindfulness. The first question, what is happening right now? And the second question, can you be with this?
whatever intention you may have in your life, whatever calls you to a greater sense of aliveness, if you are not clear what that is, you might just feel your intention to create a clearing so you may have a better sense of what that is. And all intention, I find, is aided by what's called the offering of merit. And you might even reflect over this evening of taking this time to pause, to step back from the busyness of your life. Whatever merit, whatever benefit you may have generated this evening, whatever you may generate through your intention in life, offer the benefit, the merit to yourself. You might imagine your path opening with a greater sense of ease, and well-being. Whatever merit, whatever benefit, whatever fruit may arise from your practice in your life, you might offer it freely to those in your inner circle. May these beings benefit from the fruit of your practice. And offering it out now to those you work with, those you live with. Offering out even further to those you are yet to meet on your journey. May all these beings benefit from the fruit of your practice in your life. And offering it now out to all beings. <clears throat> And including yourself. Now gently deepening your breath. And when you're ready, you can again let your eyes open. Well, thank you for your kind attention to my ramblings. A few announcements. Um, first, there is a... Uh